and you can't even see it. Yeah. How interesting. Wow. <laughs> well, you, you were telling me Why are you looking at me so strange but, No. I, this is just not where I expected this conversation to go. Oh, me either. But it's time to run the Barracuda. Yeah! G'day viewers, today's podcast was brought to you by Koala Karma, the chill out drink. That's right, they make it. They make a drink that chills you out. Forget energy drinks. you are already got enough. Look at you, you're fit, you're healthy, you're, you're good looking. You don't need any more sugar. You need to calm down and relax. Saying thank you Karma Koala and hey... Today's podcast, I loved it with such a, whoa, tell you what, a stunning blonde walked into here, which I shouldn't even say. Hey, let's face it. Hey, I shouldn't even say that stuff, but I'm a man. I've got instincts, whatever. Nicole Rolls, um, a stunning um, and hardworking uh, journalist, reporter, dancer. Uh, I'm going to let her tell the full story, of course, uh, so I'm going to just shut up right now. That's what I'm going to do. Anyway, I'm clowning around because I'm in a good mood uh, because I had a bubbly person in this chair. And I love bubbly people. So thank you, Nicole. Here we go. Are you ready? Yes, we are. Are you there, Nicole? Mwah! Nicole Rolls. Hi. How, how are you, you doing? How are you, champion? Good, eh? Yeah. I'm, I'm a long way away now. I'm reclining. That was a bit of a reach to get your hand. But, um, yeah, I'm so excited to be here. This is my first ever podcast. Yes. In my life. Yes. So, yeah, I'm doing a new thing today. I'm excited. Good, good. Have you ever um, listened to any other shows ever? Um, podcasts. I've listened to a bit of Hamish and Andy. Yeah, um, great. And that's pretty much it. So I'm a bit of a, a, a podcast newbie just in right. general. I love them. I love them. I'm hooked because um, I know that you listened to a couple of things last night. Yeah, but someone say like you, uh, I met you yesterday. You're a reporter, a journalist. Yeah, we, you know. we met on the story that actually will, I'm sure, be the peak of my career. <laughs> what the fugitive snail. <laughs> because I mean, sorry, hermit crab. Crab. Because yeah. Because where on. where do you go from there? Like, how do you peak after well, a fugitive <laughs> hermit crab? Where do you go? I know. Well, let me get the story out. It was a um, say it was just a couple of days ago, I was standing out here in this, this driveway and John, um, uh, our neighbour, okay, comes out, Drew, do you own this hermit crab? I'm like, no, what? what? And, uh, and it was coloured, you remember what it's coloured, yeah, all red, these pink red so racing stripes. stripes and diamond little, uh, you know, bedazzlers <laughs> yeah. or whatever, covered in this stuff and we're like, no, and he said, just walked in my front driveway. So that, like, I think 24 hours later they went to the pet shop. Which is probably 300 metres or more. Easily. Right? Yeah, easily 300 metres. Down the meters. hill, around the corner. Yeah. And they went, do you know its name? Uh, no, they don't have a name oh. for it because it's, it's in the pet shop. So they want someone else to. But I reckon now it's going to be the most in-demand hermit crab ever <laughs> yeah. in the world. <laughs> but do you know the funny thing? We saw, um, like, because they've got decorated shells, you know, all sorts of different bez- bedazzled shells, yeah. frozen and all different things. And we saw, like, a before shot of what the hermit crab's shell looked like before it True. went on the run. And it was, like, pristine and now it's all, like, scratched off. So that hermit crab had, like, a wild you journey. Th- yeah, you Think it about heavy. it. <laughs> and you think about how bummed it'd be right now. <laughs> Like the amazing adventure. Oh, and to finish the story, right, was it something like eight got out? Was that the story? Oh, this is the second-hand story I got, no? Well, no, actually, they say that they used to get out regularly. Like they had a tank with like an open top. So they'd climb up the sort of decorations in the tank and they can stretch a really long way. Here's a fun fact that I didn't know about hermit crabs, which is that they've got inside the shell, they've got like a hook on their exoskeleton that like – clips onto the the shell itself Uh so they can stretch out of the shell a really long way so it like stretched from the decoration to the side of the tank and then they just like free fall out of the tank and so they get out they used to get out regularly and just wander around the shop but this one like jailbreaked out of the shop and walked yeah down here and came face to face with (laughs) a a long way and happened to walk into a packaged food Food packaging place. They do things for the airport, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Their and food like goes on the plane. Yeah. Is it right? Yeah, so of all the things, got through all those animals. 
It's a wild street, this street. Yeah, I think Drew's uh, planning a, a jailbreak for the... I reckon. <laughs> for the hermit crab. They're in maximum security now. <laughs> oh, what a great story. I know. Such a good story. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> You've done a million stories, though, I bet. Have you? Um, look, I've been doing this for two years. Um, only here on the Gold Coast, and it's such a cool place to. I'm from Brisbane. Yeah, but this what part? Is, Where? Um, Paddington. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I grew up in Springwood. Oh, Underwood. did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. Yeah, kind of really. in the middle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not that nice. No, well, um, yeah. It's no, it's a good place to do news. It's interesting because there are those kind of like fun, quirky stories, but then we can also do. You know, there's lots of hard news going on as well. So we get a nice yep. little gentle blend of both, which is awesome. Is that, um, I looked you up. I try and make, I try and make, oh. yeah, I try and make a, um, oh, I'm pretty lazy too. So I try not to overlook people because the best part is them describing some things and then we go off track and start talking about all sorts of other weird things they forget. Right. Yep. What interests me, um, Moulin Rouge dancer. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know what? Um, it's funny. Like I think in Australia, people are becoming more and more well-traveled here, but even still, with the amount of people, the number of people, I should say, um, going overseas and travelling and having different experiences, there's a lot of people here that still think that that is something different from what it actually is. And I think it's partly because of the film, like if you've seen the film. It, yeah, well, that's all I know, really. Yeah, it comes across as like it's it's a, a brothel or whatever, which it actually... Oh, I didn't think that. Yeah, well, I mean, they've taken creative license and I love that film, don't get me wrong, it's yeah. awesome. But, you know, obviously the, the actual theatre and the actual um, show is really, really different from that. Like, um, <laughs> I've had people ask in the past, like, if I danced for tips and stuff like that, but it's not that kind of show, you know, and I think, like, one of the cool things about... Hey, hang on, so back yeah. up, so you were in... <laughs> I read that. Yes, yeah, you, so, you lived in Paris. So I lived in Paris, and I was I was a dancer at the Moulin Rouge. So I danced there and worked there for like twelve months. Amazing. Um, and yeah, I did the can can and stuff like that, which amazing. is so cool because um, you know, being over there and it's an amazing job. Like, um, there's a lot of Australians that work over there, so it's kind of this cool little family of expats and the job and the people there. They they look after you really well, so that you have a great experience over there. But one of the things they do as well is um, they talk to you about like the history of of the show and the history of of what the actual culture there is with the Moulin Rouge because it's such an icon in France. And one of the things that I found really fascinating is the idea of like the origin of the can can. That was my favourite number to do in the show, and I'd never really thought about like how it started. But if you've seen the can can or you know anything about it, you know that they pick their legs up and they scream and they're holding their skirts up and shaking them. Yeah. And how that started was um, with uh, the like women who lived in, you know, squalor basically and they were like washerwomen and they had these really horrible, like physically draining, monotonous jobs. And at the end of the day, they'd go to these like dance halls and just bust out and like, you know, do raunchy things like lift their skirts up above right. their ankles and yep. shake them and scream and stuff like that. And that's how the can-can started. And the cool thing about that, I think, is that, um, you know, the idea of, of them dancing for men isn't necessarily true. Like the men came later because they found out that the girls were doing this and it was so crazy and, right, you know, yeah. there was so it was so revolutionary for that time. It was like the 1800s. So really that the whole thing of them dancing and the men watching, the men came later, like the girls were only ever dancing yeah. for themselves. And I think that's really cool. It's something that well, and, and had never occurred to me. Oh, what a great story. I imagine that you working there now, it would, it would be a massive tourist destination, right? Yeah, huge. It would be nowhere near a brothel. <laughs> like no. it's, a, it's a dance, it's a it's a. Like a Broadway. I, yeah. would, I would think of it as, well, we're in France. Let's go to uh, Moulin Rouge. Come on, let's go. Yeah, you know? it's right up there with, yeah, like Broadway and yeah. and Vegas and stuff. And it is, like, if you go, it's such a magic show. Like, it's so cool to watch. I've seen it, you know, obviously, yeah. being in it That's and amazing. also seeing it so many times. But you can't, you know, you never get sick of it. It's awesome. Wow, and you were there. You know, I heard something really cool. And, and it has to do... Um, Okay, apparently, yeah. when, when we were, when there was no electricity, and you think about when you go camping, right? You yeah. go, you pretty much, as soon as the sun goes down and you sit around the campfire and everyone's like, well, I'm going to bed, it's like eight o'clock <laughs> because it's been yeah. sort of three or four hours since it's, it turned dark. Yeah. So you fall asleep. Apparently, 
in those times where it was all just candlelight and fires and stuff, yeah. we would all wake up around 10 o'clock at night and then we'd be awake till around 2 and then go for and sleep again what? for another four hours before dawn. So when they – apparently – yeah. When electricity was created, uh, Paris was a big city that was – like it's, it had a lot of electricity first. Yeah. And the Moulin Rouge got very popular because it became like nighttime people were going out. Like uh, oh. this, is, this is only what I heard about yeah. 18 months ago, but it was – yeah, it, it was historically this place where for nighttimers. Yeah, so, right. So, you know, the men would get out. All the kids are still at home, but you could get out there and watch uh, girls dance. It's sort of yeah. bawdy sort of entertainment for yeah. nighttimers. In brackets, you know. How I love cool. That well, they have like, um, you know, in, in French, they have a lot of like words for what we would have multiple words here for, like, you know, pulling an all-nighter um, right. is in France, that's called nuit blanche, like a Excellent. white night, staying up all night. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's wow. kind of that, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. It's a nuit, cool show. Nuit blanche. Nuit blanche. Nuit yeah. Blanche. So you're obviously very fluent. No. <laughs> Actually, I'm not like, I tried so hard to learn French but the problem is like everyone over there speaks such good English it's hard to even get to the point where like if they hear you speak with a dodgy French accent they'll immediately switch to English because they're so excited to practice their English so I was always like to the French girls uh, that I was working with and guys that I wanted them to like you have to speak French to me but you know they wanted to practice too so (laughs) I understand that yeah Yeah. I go to Japan every year my so oh, everyone cool. wants to speak Japanese to me and I'm like, oh, English to me. Yeah. <laughs> and when I try and speak Japanese back to them, they're like, no, you're not giving me the fun that I want. You yeah. know, I want, I want to be able to say yes and no. And, and we're nowhere near as good as they are, so it's not yeah. like as, as engaging for them. <laughs> no. So You're right though. You have to sort of lock yourself out and live, you know. Yeah, completely in a, immerse in the language. How long ago was this? Uh, 2008. So I'm an old lady okay. now. That was, uh, so I auditioned – when I was in high school, when I was 17, and um, of course oh, you have right. to be 18 to be in the show. So um, a few months after I auditioned, I'd sort of forgotten all about it, and then I got an email, just a really brief email. Auditioned from, in Australia? Yeah, they come here um, pretty much every year to audition. You'd be surprised. It's probably, I, I would say over 60% of the cast is Australian yeah. expats. They like the work ethic. They like the look, you know, athletic wow. girls that aren't super skinny or, okay. you know, so. Um, and you and have look to be at you, tall blonde. As well. You must be six foot something. F- I'm five, ten and a half. I'm cheating today. No wearing way. heels. But, um, <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so they, they come here every year. They used to come to Brisbane every year. Now I think they just got to Sydney and Melbourne. Okay. Um, yeah, so I auditioned, got this super brief email. Just being like, yeah, we want you to be part of the show once you turn 18. Um, and I was like, hell yeah, right. <laughs> of course. And do, you, and do you think, say, with Baz Luhrmann making Milan Rouge, definitely every Aussie knows it. You know what it's like? Yeah. A, have you ever heard of these things where um, a band is massive here? Like a, a band that we all know, like Dandy Warhols are a huge yeah. example of this story. Back in the day, turns out they're not even that famous in America. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't know that. We're just like, yeah, this great American, they're massive, they're big, you know. And they, that's obviously the same with films. Like some, we, we, we're probably a huge market for particularly that, uh, that Moulin Rouge. Yeah, yeah. Aussies, get some Aussies there and keep this thing happening, you know. Yeah, well, I think they, like, they marketed the film. It was so cool. Like it was a few years before my time there, but, you know, the, the entire cast right. went to the show and got pictures with the cast of the show and I was like, dang it, right. I missed it, you know, missed meeting Nicole Kidman. But, yeah, like I think they tried to market it to yeah. to overseas. I don't know how successful it was in the States, but, yeah, certainly, you know, that Aussie pride with Baz Luhrmann and, and Nicole and Kidman. Nicole, yeah. yeah, like and it, it's such a good film as well. It's so cool to watch. It kind of even has, like if you go and see the show at the Mulan, I think like a lot of the, the cinematography – in the film is kind of like inspired by the show because right. it's that kind of ethereal, like glittery, kind of really show showy sort of uh, um, piece of work. And no, yeah, no. I think a lot of that is similar to 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 the show itself, which is fiery at the moment, which is magic. Right. In, I think it's magic. Oh, I hope there's no French people listening. <laughs> so that, hang on. So you're 17, okay, uh, in Brisbane. Mm-hmm. Uh, did your parents flip out? Uh, can I ask you that? <laughs> yeah, you can ask. Um, yeah. Look, no, my parents are cool. They're, um, my my mum was worried about telling my gran because she thought that she might have a heart attack. Um, right. But actually she is extremely well-travelled and she'd seen the show like 
I don't know, back in the 70s or something like that. And she was rapt about it. She was so excited. Really? So there was never a moment where I was like, oh, God, everyone's going to flip out. I was more worried.